Hello there and welcome to my talk about visualization of nonlinear programming for robot motion planning. My name is David Hegele and this is a joint work between me, Mortas Abdelal, Oscar Oguts, Marc Toussaint and Daniel Weiskopf. So let's jump right in and talk a bit about robot motion planning first. Uh, so we have a robot and we have a task for that robot. For example, get a book from a shelf and move it to a target area. So now that we have this task, we need uh, to calculate how this robot should move, like a motion path for the robot. Uh, and in order to do so, we can use um, nonlinear programming. So we have an expert, and this expert will formalize this task into a set of uh, equations, basically. And with these equations, um, a few properties of this motion path can be um, yeah, expressed. For example, like a smooth motion, also feasible motion, like um, the robot not intersecting itself, um, not going um, faster than it can, um, respecting some of the physical, physical world constraints, um, and this kind of stuff. Uh, and then that we have this uh, nonlinear program, we can feed this into a solver. Um, the solver is kind of a black box, it will um, do some optimization um, and then print out uh, the solution. Um, so, uh, here in this example, we see the robot then performing the task of um, getting the book from a shelf and putting it into the green target area here. Yeah, but in this scenario, a lot of things can go wrong. And our experts, um, uh, they had some, some specific problems, for example, um, like very long lasting optimizations and not converging optimizations, for example. Um, so the optimizer would go on, uh, like the solver would go on for ever and not come up with a solution. Um, and they also have problems with um, the solver actually um, putting out solutions that are unsatisfactory, um, for example, non-optimal and also infeasible, for example. Um, and, and in this example, we, we see um, the robot actually performing some um, motion that is not even possible. For example, he has a gripper um, and then he pulls on the book with the edge of the gripper, which is not possible. Um, it, with the gripper, it should grab the book somehow uh, or push it, but he cannot pull it like that. Uh, and also, I think there's some self-intersection going on here, like right now, yeah, here. Um, so this kind of stuff happens. Um, and the experts um, then have to come up with a, a solution for that. Like uh, one thing they could do is like uh, change the hyperparameters of their solver and also they could change uh, the program itself. Um, so, but in order to do so, there has to be some troubleshooting of the, the previous uh, optimization that put out the uh, yeah, unsatisfactory solution or did not even put out a solution. Um, so, this is the perfect opportunity to, for us um, to, to access this black box of the solver. Um, and we like to use uh, visual analytics to um, troubleshoot um, the optimization that was going on. Um, so our idea is like uh, having, uh, um, enabling the, the expert to look into, into their solver and into the optimization that was going on and then explore um, what was going wrong and yeah, then being able to take action. So let's move on with the visualization approach. For 2D problems, it's usually quite simple to show the solver progression. For example, here we have the starting point of the solver, and then it moves here on this red trajectory to the optimum in this optimization space. Um, these here are the constraint boundaries, and this white region here is the feasible region. Uh, and these arrows here, they point to the unconstrained optimum of the objective function. So in our case, we don't have a 2D problem, but a high dimensional problem, because the argument that we're optimizing is a robot motion path. So um, in high dimensionalities, we can always use uh, dimensionality reduction, uh, and we can also show uh, such a trajectory. <clears throat> so this, for example, is a trajectory um, projected down um, using PCA, and what we can see here, for example, is the optimizer getting stuck for a moment and then getting out of there again 
uh, recovering somehow, and then yeah, moving to the optimum here. Um, but this is not very informative. There's a lot of things that we cannot answer from this kind of visualization. Uh, for example, one thing that we don't know, uh, for example, is what what a point on this trajectory means. Um, and actually, one point is just uh, an intermediate uh, motion path, so to say. So what we can do is we can explode this trajectory, and then we get a trajectory like a trajectory, an optimization trajectory for every single uh, pose of the robot. Um, and this dashed line here uh, it connects all of these individual robot poses. So this is kind of uh, the motion path. And you can see here how this evolves from being totally chaotic, randomized in the beginning to a smooth, um, yeah, nice path. Another thing that we can do in order to put this optimization trajectory into context is to use a loss landscape. So this has been done before for the analysis of uh, neural networks. And the basic idea is to use a 2D plane slice to slice through the high, op uh, high dimensional optimization space. Uh, and when, what we can get from that is like we can sample the high dimensional optimization space and get a 2D scalar field. And then we can also project the trajectory into this plane. So then we can see, for example, here, how the optimization trajectory relates to the surrounding landscape um, yeah, of the optimization space. But there's also some pitfalls in using this technique. For example, um, here we, we can see that the optimizer is moving from this valley to another valley here. And for this, it has to climb kind of over a mountaintop. And this is uh, very unusual for like iterative methods that use gradient descent or Newton's method. Um, so they would usually only go downhill. Um, and this is not a, not a very reasonable thing to happen. So, but what's actually happening is that the trajectory is moving um, also in the null space of this projection here. Um, but we cannot see this because the plane is not oriented uh, correctly for us to, to see this kind of. Um, so since plane orientation is such a big factor to use this effectively, um, we have some cues here, the line thickness of the, tra of the trajectory here. Um, it indicates uh, the, yeah, the distance to, to this uh, plane. Um, so if the line is very thick, that it means that it, the trajectory is further away from the plane. And if it's thick, then it coincides, like the tra tra trajectory coincides with uh, this cutting plane um, of the uh, optimization landscape. So uh, over here, we can also uh, include um, the constraints, uh, because over here, we only have like the, uh, the objective function displayed. But if we include the constraints, we can also reason about um, the shape of the trajectory. For example, here um, we see that the optimizer is moving in this parabola shape, um, whereas it would be way more efficient to just move uh, directly to this point in a straight line. But it cannot do that because the constraints here, um, yeah, it confine the trajectory somehow so because the solver is not allowed to go into these uh, infeasible regions. So let's move on to the visual analytics system that we've built in order to troubleshoot and to analyze these kind of optimization runs. So up here we have an uh, optimization landscape view and then robot path evolution view the, that I just talked about. And down here we have uh, views showing the constraints and how the constraint values evolve over the optimization process. So usually they are converging towards zero uh, but here, for example, you can see one that is increasing in the end. So this one is being violated um, and it is an indicator for uh, the solution not being valid uh, uh, and not feasible. And because there are so many of these constraints in place, we also aggregate them into groups. Um, they share common names and um, this allows us to reduce visual clutter. So if we're interested in a specific group, in all of the constraints of one group. You can also expand that. 
um, to see like all of the individual constraints. Okay, so let me walk you through an analysis scenario that you can do using our system. So we are loading the log file of the optimization run, and this is what we presented with. Um, yeah, so first thing we do, we look at the constraints. And here, for the equalities, we see that this orange group uh, is violated, and here in the inequalities, we see that this purple group is violated. Um, so next, we look into the individual constraints of these groups and to see what is going on there. Um, and here for the purple constraints, we see that most of them are violated. And for the orange constraint, we see that yeah, most of them are actually converging to zero, uh, which is nice. And yeah, some of them are actually yeah, violated, are actually violated. So now we want to know why 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 is this happening? Um, why are the constraints not not uh, satisfied? Um, so we are looking into the optimization space now, uh, using our optimization landscape. Uh, and in order to display um, the constraints there, we, we need to turn this feature on. And yeah, this is what, what we see. And because we're, yeah, because the constraints are violated, we see that we're in an infeasible area. This is why uh, the whole area is now patterned uh, with this checkerboard. Um, but we can increase the feasibility threshold of the, of the constraints, and then we can start to see uh, the boundaries of, of the constraints. So looking into um, yeah, the, the regions um, that are yeah, defined by these different uh, equalities, we see that for the, for the orange constraints um, that it forms this kind of uh, feasible area here. And for the purple constraint, it forms this kind of feasible area. Uh, and what we can see here is that they're kind of contradicting. So in order to, uh, yeah, to satisfy the orange constraint, we need to be located below this area, somewhere down here. Um, in order to, yeah, to satisfy this purple constraint, we need to be located in here. And this is, it's, it's not possible to, yeah, to do this. Um, so that's probably why um, the, yeah, the optimization did not successfully uh, end. Uh, another thing that we can see is when we zoom out, um, then we can see that there's some more areas of uh, which, which could um, be feasible areas for this constraint. Um, and we also get like uh, yeah an idea of the shape of this constraint, which is yeah it's highly nonlinear and also has like some zigzaggy patterns here. Um, so it is kind of a complicated function that is probably uh, behind this. If you now take a very close look at the trajectory of the optimization, like zooming in very much, then we can also see um, something interesting happening here. So this here is where the optimizer ended up in the end. And uh, yeah, this is the way it came from. And we can see that the trajectory is oscillating quite heavily. And this is due to these contradicting um, yeah, constraints. Because in one step, the optimizer is moving into, into a direction where it would violate a constraint less. Um, and, in the, and by doing so, it violates uh, another constraint more heavily, and then it has to move back again. And uh, yeah, this way it creates this zigzag pattern here. Um, so yeah, um, th that's also why it takes such a long time to actually uh, yeah to end up anywhere. So because of this back and forth movement here, um, it wastes quite quite some time there. This information can be very valuable to the author of the nonlinear program. With this, you can now reformulate um, the program um, so that it is solved more easily. Now, let me conclude with some future work and some lessons learned during this design study. So what we learned is that the domain experts that create these nonlinear programs they want to connect their optimization space and the real world in the analysis. So 
For example, if they look at a point on the, on, on the trajectory, the optimization trajectory, they want to know what it means. What is, like, what is the corresponding motion of the robot for this point in, in the optimization space? And they would rather uh, watch an animation of the robot performing this motion than the generic path projection that we provided there. Um, and another thing that we noticed is that um, using the loss landscape is quite tricky. Uh, because the plane orientation is crucial for effective use of that. Um, so there's an implicit assumption on the trajectory when using um, this technique that it is moving only in a 2D subspace, and this is highly optimistic. Um, so it, it often happens that um, the trajectory is actually moving moving more in in the in the null space of the projection than in the current um, yeah in the current plane uh, of uh, of the yeah of the loss landscape. And if we provide cues for this movement, um, this improves assessment greatly because um, the analyst can then judge the visualization based on, on these cues and um, maybe uh, knows that he has to reorient the, the plane in order to get a, yeah, a trustworthy um, landscape. And controlling the plane orientation is uh, unfortunately, very challenging because um, yeah, it involves this very high dimensional space and um, moving a plane in a high dimensional space is quite challenging. So um, this is also something that we want to look into in, in future work here. Speaking of future work, yes, we want to look into effective plane orientation for lost landscapes. And we also plan to visualize multiple optimization runs at once. Um, so this this would allow us to to look into the influence that random initialization has and different hyperparameters of the optimizer have on the final outcome. So we can do some sensitivity analysis there. Um, we also like to take more quantities of the optimization process into account to allow for a more thorough uh, analysis of the whole of the whole process. For example, the gradient forces um, and also dual parameters. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So let me end my talk. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions.